Amen. It's good to have Shay in service with us over here. Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. Tell you what, he has been so faithful for a long time, and and I, I told him the other day. Well, I told him that a long time ago, but I told him the other day. I said, I said, you know, Shay, I. The only time that I can say I absolutely must have you, I'm sorry, you're going to have to put everything I must have at the conference. But I said, we'll find a way. And uh, we've had a couple of people, <clears throat> we've had three people, and if anybody else would like to do this, we've had three people who are lined up for a class taught by Shea as to how to run sound. And uh, the interesting thing uh, was uh, I had... Uh, I woke up one morning and I felt like the Lord told me, you know, go ask Joan if she'd like to run sound. And I said, oh, Lord, come on, you know. You know and uh, so I went ahead and obeyed. And she was all excited. She said, I've always wanted to run sound. And I just love that. You know what I mean? I love the Lord and I love how he is in us. And, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing. So um, Anyway, we're, we're looking forward to, I mean, we're getting so small, it's not, the more we can all learn individually, the better off we are. And I guess I said start the equipment, but here we are talking again. And I will say that Cassie had mentioned to me that uh, her book uh, is almost full on her breakdown book. One, it's almost full of breakdowns she's had since... <laughs> That was good, Cassie. I like that one. <laughs> yeah, well, she hadn't got to the breakthroughs yet, but she's riding down the breakdowns, and, you know, it's almost full. Praise God. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Amen. All righty. Well, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> so if you'll turn there to verse 1, we're going to look at a couple of scriptures there, but... Um, I've got a new motto, and that it relates to when I'm sharing. <clears throat> so this is for people on Skype or people here, and uh, the, the things that I share with you from the pulpit, uh, my motto is, if you don't get it, forget it. <clears throat> In other words, go and just ask the Lord then and, and say, you know, help me get this if it's from you, and don't worry about, you know, uh, trying to retain or hold everything, or <clears throat> that's not the goal. The goal is to keep our hearts tender to the Lord and to, to not just become a, 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 a brick wall to his word, not that anybody's done that. But, I mean, we need to, you know, we all need to mind our garden, you know, and tend the, tend the soil and keep it soft and pliable before the Lord. <clears throat> um, uh, but I've, I've kind of told you this before, you know, uh, never, never trust a preacher, okay? Amen? Are you? Okay. All right. Well, I just want you to know that if you just consented to what I said, then you just did the opposite of what I said. Because I'm a preacher, and I asked you to never, <laughs> never trust one. You go, oh, amen, I'm trusting that. <laughs> Just hear from the Lord is the, is the thing. <clears throat> All right. Romans 8 and verse 1. <clears throat> we'll be looking at other verses here, but <clears throat> Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. All right. <clears throat> Let's stop there. How many of you know this scripture? All right. Know it by heart. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And I know that, you know, all of us here, we're hungry for the Lord, and we, you know, we're not playing. We want the Lord. And uh, we want to live without condemnation. Amen? How many of you want to live without condemnation? Uh, we want to, we don't want to feel like we're failing God, and we don't want to feel like that we live too much in the flesh. How many of you feel sometimes you live too much in the flesh? <clears throat> and we don't want that. Um, and we, we can get sort of <clears throat> in a, a hamster wheel where we feel like we never measure up to God or others' expectations. Uh, we feel pressure and all these things. 
And there is a very definite lack of, of that thing of no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation. <clears throat> And uh, my, my little mind, I say, okay, now why, Lord, do you say there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ when I'm in Christ, and yet I feel condemnation from time to time? You know, anybody know what I'm talking about? <clears throat> and, um, you know, uh, I think the biggest reason is what the rest of this verse says. <laughs> There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And, you know, to me it's like, okay, well, is there no condemnation in Christ? Or, you know, I mean, is, is there just really no condemnation in Christ? Or is there just no condemnation as long as, you know, I don't walk in the flesh and I don't sin and I don't do anything you know, out of the will of God that would, you know, send me back into condemnation. Anybody know what I'm talking about when I'm, I'm saying that? <clears throat> so in my mind, I'm considering this lofty reality of being in Christ and the, and the power that seems to be behind the statement. I mean, I, I sense the Lord in the statement. There's therefore now no condemnation. I sense the Lord in that. But... <clears throat> Uh, there, that, there's that huge gulf that seems to be there that says, you know, indeed, the reality that is true in the resurrection, which is, you know, in Christ, the resurrected Christ in whom we dwell, <clears throat> there is no condemnation. But that, that no condemnation and the power of that resurrection, resurrection being are reality that we're supposedly in is as fragile as just walking in the flesh one time and messing up. I mean, anybody, I'm just trying to get to see if anybody has ever thought this way, you know, and you kind of go, <clears throat> you know, what's the point of making this glorious truth so big and yet we, we're so easily, I mean, it just takes the slightest thing then, therefore, to trip us up, you know, because it's only true for those, it's not true for those who are in Christ, it's true for those who walk not in the flesh, but in the spirit. That's the way we read it. Now, that's not what it's saying. That's not what it's saying. That's not the meaning. We'll look at the scriptures to, to see it a little closer so that we can understand what the Spirit of God's trying to say, <clears throat> but this thing of walking not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And uh, the scriptures over in 2 Corinthians 5, we're not going to go there yet, but the scriptures over in 2 Corinthians 5, they really, really deal with this, and they really use this kind of terminology, and they really are trying to bring us into this powerful, uh, the reality of God that he has declared concerning his son, in son, in Christ, no condemnation. Uh, this covenant is better than the old covenant. You know what I mean? I mean, those things come up in me. Well, if this is a better covenant, why is it so flimsy? You know, and we're, I'm not saying it is, I'm saying my understanding is like that. If this, is the, if this is the new covenant, it's built on better promises, yeah, I'm in Christ as long as I don't mess up once. Yeah. Well, and that would not, then verse 1 would be no relief from chapter 7. Yeah, absolutely. No relief because it's like, I'm trying, but I'm screwing up, and I keep doing the wrong thing. I want to do the right thing, but I keep doing the wrong thing. So who's going to save me? This sucks. Yeah. It's like, well, praise be to God, you know, blah, 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 there's no condemnation as long as you're not doing those things. Right, right. Like, well, Amen. Well, I don't, I'm sure you all heard him, but it, he's saying it's, if, uh, if what we're saying here is the true meaning of this, then there's absolutely no relief from Romans 7. You're just back in the same boat because as soon as you mess up, you're back in that boat. And yet the end of Romans 7, he's going, I thank God through Jesus Christ. I mean, there's this, there's this breakthrough, you know, that, but it's a breakthrough into you can tell uh, into another reality, another realm that's higher, and, and he's calling it in Christ. 
here. And it's, a, and it's a real reality, and I think we all know that, and yet, and yet our minds continually go back to those kind of things because, you know, we haven't really seen it. Now, here's, here's, the, here's the thought I was having, too, on the way up here. Excuse me while I... take care of a dry throat, and that is, <clears throat> there's this thing of no condemnation, if, we, if it's so powerful, if it's so wonderful, why do we still have condemnation? And as I began to think on that, I felt like the Lord said, it's because you you know, and I'm applying this to me, it's because you believe the teaching, but you haven't seen the reality of in Christ no condemnation that will genuinely hold you forever. Okay. And we haven't dealt with these scriptures and some others right now to, to help you do that, but <clears throat> I felt like the Holy Spirit was was saying to me, I am telling you that there is a reality of no condemnation based totally on this reality of in Christ, that if you know it, if it is, if that truth is true, it is true for all time. Okay, and it will, it will defeat condemnation. Well, God, I, I think that's good news. Amen. You know? Man, I, th I think that's good news. But I don't want to hear about the good news. Because the good news goes, oh, and then I get hope, and then I fall back into, you know what I mean? You know, because I, I haven't grasped it the way the Lord wants me to grasp it. You know? <clears throat> you can grasp something in the new creation fellowship way and not have grasped it Amen. in the Lord. Amen. You know? And that's not what the Lord wants. It's not what I want. <clears throat> All right, so, um, <clears throat> the, so there is this lack of, of uh, or, the, or let's just call it this, there is this condemnation that comes, and there is this place of lack of condemnation. And the place of lack of condemnation, or no condemnation, is in Christ. And we must know that by the Holy Spirit. And the place of condemnation is outside of Christ or in the flesh. And particularly outside of Christ in the flesh, in the religious flesh, because that's really, remember Romans 7? The issue wasn't that he was, you know, wanting to do all sorts of horrible things and just go do rank sin and stuff like that. He's trying to obey the word of God or the law. He's trying his best to please God. This is not some guy going, oh, I just like sinning. You know, I mean, he really wanted to, <clears throat> but the whole issue that kept dragging him back down was his inability to do what only can be done or what is done or what is finished in Son or in Christ. That is, that is, will secure you like a mighty fortress from condemnation. All right, so uh, verse one again, then we'll read down a little bit. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Okay, so we're seeing, a, we're seeing another law there, aren't we? We're seeing something other than the, the old covenant tables of stone. We're seeing that there's a law that's in Christ, not Christ's law. It's not tables of stone that God is obeying. It's the law of the spirit of life that is in Christ and is available potentially for all those who are in Christ. All right? And so, so he says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That law of spirit of life is not here.
It's in Christ. And so if we doctrinally say, well, I'm in Christ, I'm secure, I, there's no condemnation, stuff like that, but then we fail in the flesh, you know, then we're measuring ourselves not by the reality that we're in Christ, or we're measuring ourselves not by Christ, in union with Christ. We are measuring ourselves exactly the way the Jews did. An external law that we're trying to keep which is exactly what Romans 7 was all about. Okay? There's lots of condemnation. <laughs> it's called the ministry of condemnation. Do you know that? It's the ministry, it's God's ministry of condemnation. He wants to condemn you. He wants you to be condemned in in the old covenant or in the law or trying to keep the law or trying to be right in yourself or 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 he wants you to be condemned when you get outside of his son, when you leave Jesus in the way that he wants Jesus to be related to and participated in. So he's He's not upset about that. I mean, look at what that condemnation did to, the, to Romans 7, to the guy in Romans 7, Paul, or whatever. Look what it did. It brought him down, 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 until he, he finally said, you know, oh, wretched man that I, I can't do it. I'm not good enough. But it's not, it, folks, <clears throat> it is a wrong concept to go through that process and go down, 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 and say, I can't do it. I'm not worthy, old wretched man that I am. Lord, you do it. Looking strictly within yourself instead of in your union in Christ. The law of the spirit of the life is not in you. It's in Christ. And you're in Christ. Well, I think we probably have some people here who have done that. You've gone down, you've gotten condemned and everything, and then you're just kind of standing there, you know, Lord, you're going to have to do it because I can't do it. He's, and he's, you know, he's thinking, well, I kind of already did it. He's raised, and so are you. And you need to start, you know, remember what Jesus said when he was about to go away. He said that where I am, you may be also. Well, we all take that as heaven. Well, that's fine. Good. Go to heaven. But there's something better in heaven. You know, Jesus has been exalted above the heavens. You know. You know, I can see some people who are, you know, all ready for the rapture, you know. And they're, oh, yeah, you know. And they woo! And so they're going up and they're, whoo, they shoot right through heaven and on past that. And they're, wait a minute. That's, that's what I was aiming at. Where am I going? You know, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a foolish man with my pictures and stuff. But I can, you know, people are shocked when you start talking about something higher than heaven that Jesus might actually be that. And that's not just talking about exalting him higher than the heavens. That's saying he is raised up higher than the heavens. And you're raised up and made to sit together in him. All they are is words. until the Spirit of God breathes all the realm of God to us in such a manner that it destroys condemnation. You remember in the book of Daniel where that rock was hewn out and it hit that mountain and destroyed it? That old kingdom, the old way, the old way of relating, of, uh, as we'll see very shortly, knowing ourselves after the flesh and knowing one another. <clears throat> um, so, verse uh, 3, for what the law could not do, what now, now see it's back to the Ten Commandment law, the, the Decalogue, um, the external law. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, trying to keep the law and measuring up based on that. Do you see, is it starting to a little bit 
form that that's exactly what this is talking about, that that is the actual meaning here, that he's trying to get you to uh, break with living your life down here in the sense of trying to, to measure up and find that instead of you coming up to a certain level of righteousness, which means less flesh to you, but not to God. The cross settled less flesh. <laughs> you know, you won't. You're not going to settle this less flesh. You know, we say more of Jesus, less of me. Well, good. Look at the cross. Amen. Really? No, no. I mean, you know, that's the, that may be a cliche to some, but I, yeah, I, I'm not clicheing it today. <laughs> However you want to take that. I'm telling you. That when you see the cross, you see all, as in Adam all die, all done away. But then you see a resurrection, and it's an in Christ resurrection. It's not, the resurrection in Christ is a reality that must be held at all times. At all times. You have to know that bef almost before you get into any other truth. But, you, I mean, you have to know the cross first because that's what gets you in there and, and, and convinces you, you know. I mean, when Paul said, for you are dead, he expected those believers to hear that and go, you know what, we are dead. Or to find it out to such a degree that uh, those that were going after the Lord with Paul they had this thing of being dead. Okay. But you're dead, but your life is hid with Christ in God. When your life appears, then you appear. You're dead to this existence on this plane in the sense of, now, you know, we'll explain this a little more in a minute, but in the sense of, of particularly in the sense of trying to measure up, trying to get out of condemnation, trying to be what the Lord wants you to be, trying not to fail, trying not to, you know, all these things about walking in the flesh that we have applied to that, he's trying to get you out of that. And we, we use this scripture to condemn us and stay in it. And this very verse is not talking about that. It's talking about leaving all of those thoughts and everything and find your righteousness, find your hope, find your peace there and realize that your status before God is Christ. <laughs> to Jesus. Salud. Glory to God. You don't, th you don't think that's going to knock out some condemnation if your status before God is Christ? You don't think that's going to, I mean, you're going to go, you know what? It's not based on this anymore, and God is bringing me. Because, you know, as you abide in that vine, abide in Christ, abide in that reality, abide in Christ, abide in the vine, abide in the resurrection reality, then... Christ as the resurrection will come forth through you and bring forth fruit. <clears throat> but your status is not based on your fruit. <clears throat> it's based on Christ. It's not even based on what Christ did. You're in Christ. You're not just saved by Christ. You're not just helped. That's what the Jews had. Do you understand? That's what the Jews had. Okay, I'll come down there and help you. Okay, you got some enemies? I'll deal with that. Okay, you got this? I'll deal with that. You're in him. And now he's the, you know, and this all gets into the book of Hebrews, but he is the surety of a better covenant. Yes. Did you have a comment? Yes. It, I've had on my mind a lot lately, David, and his, in the Psalms where he would say things like, you know, I'm going to
Right. Amen. And that relationship with the Lord <clears throat> is the, the, the power of God for no condemnation. But it's not a relationship like, well, I need to relate to the Lord right. I need to not relate in my flesh. I need to be more spiritual. It's not that. That's not what it's even talking about. <laughs> yeah, you're still over in Romans 7. And, you know, you're going, well, I'm, you know, I remember somebody coming for counseling. And they said, Pastor Randy, I'm at the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> The more they talk, the more I knew, no, you ain't yet, you know. Right. There's still another, there's a, you've hit a false bottom. There's a, right. oh, I think you got maybe five or six more. Oh, <laughs> but, the, but, but honestly, honestly, the bottom of the barrel or the, or the just to the max uh, being broken over your failures is someone who gets up finally and stops beating themselves and trying to be something and freaking out all the time over their failure and calling their failures walking in the flesh when their failures are the fact that they're trying to please God. That God's, you know, he can deal with your flesh if you're in Christ because the resurrection himself will eventually manifest through you. You know, if you got, a, if you got roots and a good solid stock base, you're going to have the fruit. People say, well, Brother Randy, you're just giving people a right to sin. You know what I mean? I, I don't need to give you a right. You, I've checked your cards, and most of you had one before you met me. <laughs> you, know, the, it's not, you know, if someone doesn't want the Lord, they're going to just do whatever they want anyway. It doesn't matter what you preach. But if somebody wants the Lord, they want to hear this stuff. <laughs> Because there's actual, there's, there's substance to this, no matter how ethereal it's been. Again, if we have misread Romans 8, 1, then we think, well, there's, I, you know, there's no power to it because I've, I've tried to get it. When in reality, you never read it the way the Holy Spirit wrote it. Yes. All right. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to look at verses uh, 14 and 15. Now in these, well, actually we're going to look in more than that. We're going to look in 14 through 17. Um, but before I read it, you know, in these scriptures, there is a death and there is a resurrection. And I'm telling you, you know, it would be, it would blow your mind if you actually went through the New Testament and you just started marking every time Paul made a reference to the death or the resurrection. He does it in the weirdest places, not really, not to God, but it's weird to us because we only apply that to Easter Sunday or, you know, something like that. But to God, everything that is eternal is wrapped up in death, burial, and resurrection. That's where you find all of the keys. That's where everything yeah. springs to life, you know. And here there's a death, and here there's a resurrection. But the basis of the death here, and this is, this is important, <clears throat> um, we, can, we can get one view of the cross or two you know, the cross, the cross has a myriad of views. Did you know that? There's so many angles to the cross. But we can get one or two views. I actually have seen those from the Lord. And because we've seen that from the Lord and not any other views, we apply that view to every other reference to the cross. Okay. Well... You know, I think you see that nominal Christianity. Every time it refers to the cross, they, they just read salvation into it, salvation from hell. Well, we know that that's, there's so much more than that. <clears throat> but um, the, the basis of the death here is not that you cease to exist as a person. That's not what it's talking about. 
It's not trying to get into that sort of thing. And I, the, I wrote a statement here. The basis of resurrection here is not that now Jesus, as a self-giving lamb, must live through you. Therefore, you can no longer, number one, have fun. Number two, have friends. Number three, must now become a monk or a nun. Shall I read it again? The basis of resurrection in these scriptures are not dealing with any of what I'm about to read to you. They're not dealing with that. We need to find life in these scriptures. And we need to find the basis of death and resurrection as the Holy Spirit set it forth through the Apostle Paul to us. All right, so here's the statement. The basis of resurrection here in these scriptures is not that now Jesus, as a self-giving lamb, must live through you, therefore you can no longer have any fun, have any friends, and must now become a monk or a nun. These scriptures don't even mention that kind of stuff. These will free you from the fear of all that stuff. But you just hit somebody in the face with the other picture and it can scare somebody. You know, well, am I a non-person? No, trust me, I, you know, this church proves that we got a lot of people who are not non-persons. We have a unique group of people, and I'm being very kind with them. Right. <laughs> the word unique. <clears throat> yeah, there you go. <clears throat> yeah, well, I used to call them granola Christians, weren't you? Flakes, flakes, nuts, and what was the other? I forget it. <clears throat> All right. So let's, yeah, fruits, flakes, and nuts. All right, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he that died for all, that they, must, that they who live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. Okay, okay. We would read that as saying, I have to, I cannot live selfishly anymore, and da-da-da-da. And, you know, that's, that, again, if that happens, that's fruit of a reality. You got to get the roots. And this is dealing with the roots. And he's talking about living unto him who died and rose again, and that's you in him. And he'll, he'll prove that in the rest of the verses to the end of the chapter. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at uh, verse 16. Wherefore, Henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yea, now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, therefore, this is, this is going to tell you what is the contrast to knowing people after the flesh. Remember Romans? Anybody remember Romans? Have we gotten so far away? Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ who walk not after the flesh. It's not talking about, you know, well, I, I shouldn't have bought Calvin Klein and I, you know, I probably, you know, shouldn't have gone to that concert or this or that or what, you know, you probably shouldn't have, but that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about a reality of living outside of Christ and in your mind constantly relating to him the way you used to be before the death and resurrection of Christ. When I say that, I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about trying to serve God, be good, all that Romans 7 was talking about and all that Romans 8 circumvented. Circumvented. <clears throat> all right. So, the basis of death is that Jesus brought you into himself. Well, what does that mean? 
oh, it's so good. I don't have a clue, but it sounds good. It makes me excited. You know, this, by being brought into Christ, this ended God judging you individually ever again. As far as death, because that the cross was your death. That'll take care of a lot of condemnation. But if you get out from under that and you put yourself back under the law, what have you fallen from? You've fallen from grace. You're back under the law. You've fallen from grace. I mean, folks, only by being under the law can you fall from grace. You cannot fall from grace by sinning a certain quantity and therefore there's no more grace left. That's ridiculous. But in our minds, I've heard so many people say, think, you know, well, you know, I might have fallen from grace. I've sinned so much. I've failed so much. You cannot fall from grace that way or it wouldn't be grace. You know, where is it? In, in one of the places the scripture uses grace, and it, the actual Greek word is superabundant grace. And I looked it up, and it says more grace than you could ever use up. What? Well, that's, that's good news, too. You know, we keep going here. We might get happy at the end. <laughs> yeah, and walk out of here at least for a few minutes without condemnation. <clears throat> All right. So... So that means the measuring up thing, if, if understood correctly, it means the measuring up thing is gone. It's no longer something you're trying to do. You're the, what your measure is, is the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The fullness of Christ. See, he could have said, well, your, your measure is the measure of Jesus. We'd go, well, he's, he's me he measures really big. But it didn't say it was his measure put on you. It says your measure is him as, uh, and is the measure of the stature of his fullness. His fullness. You know. I mean, I, I remember some of the things that the Lord said to me when I first began to see this. And. And I, I thought, you know, you know, Lord Jesus, I could never measure up to you. And tried and wanted to and cared about. It. And he said, I am your measure from now on. I am your measure. Do not measure by you. You're a lousy measure. <laughs> he didn't say that. But I am all fullness for you. All fullness. Don't walk after the flesh. Does, does that make sense now? Okay, well, let's, let's do 16 and 17 again so you can see. Being at, knowing after the flesh is living outside of in Christ. And the opposite of that is, is living in Christ. Verse 15 uses the flesh first, walking after the flesh, verse 16, in Christ. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, you see it? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, you're a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God. Okay? Goes on to say, all things are of God. Who hath reconciled us unto himself? In himself. As in, who made both one in himself, and the one is himself. And now you are judged, you are judged by God first. I mean, you know, it talks about a great white throne judgment and a judgment seat of Christ. And, you know, the basic line is, you know, if you're going to be at the great white throne judgment, that's not a good thing. Anybody know, familiar with the, those judgments? You know, that's not a good thing because that's where all the sinners are going to be. But if you go to the judgment seat of Christ, you'll just be, you know, well, this and that, and you'll receive a reward or da-da-da-da, but you shall be saved yet as by fire. 
Anybody familiar with all this? I don't want to reteach the whole thing. <laughs> but, but, well, why, how do we miss the, that one then? You missed it when the death already took place for you at Calvary, and your death took place there with Christ. That's done now. The altar took care of it for you. Now, for God, it's all just based on fruit. If you're in union with him, he's the life, then some are going to bring forth some, you know, 30, 60, 100 fold. Based on how much the, of the life they let flow through them. But all that's based on fruit. That's not great white throne judgment. Again, I'm, I'm not one to teach all this. But clearly there is a lot of stuff in here that vindicates the simple phrase, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There has to be incredible vindication of, of reality and then information to us to confirm that reality in us for us to have no condemnation. Because the world, the devil, the flesh, out as far as out there, and all this stuff, you know, it's all still out there, and it's bad, and it can trip you up. But there's one thing the devil cannot do. He's, he cannot trip up the reality of you being in Christ. That'll never change. I say it'll never change. I'm, you know, I'm not a once saved, always saved person, although I was saved once, and I believe I always will be. Well, I plan on staying with the Lord. <laughs> That's just my view. God help us. Time's almost gotten away here. All right. Um, so now God only relates to you in Christ for old things have passed away. What old things? Yeah, that's, that, that's good. I like that. There was a groan. You may not even know you did it. There was a groan. The old things, folks, isn't the things that were in your old life before you met Jesus. They're the things of knowing one another, including, get ready, including knowing Jesus after the flesh. Or can I say it another way? Including no longer knowing Jesus after the Gospels. So if you ever wonder why I get persecuted. But it's absolute truth. It doesn't mean that he doesn't heal. It doesn't mean that there's not deliverance. It doesn't mean all of those things. But the Jesus we know is not there anymore, folks. He's seated at the right hand of the Father on high. And the truth that he's declaring and they sent the Holy Spirit to declare was not the Jesus that walked the earth, but the Jesus who is now risen above because Christ has now been glorified. I have not sent yet the Holy Spirit because I am not glorified. Well, the glorification is the resurrection. And he's declaring, you know, uh, it's, you know, I've used this example before, but, it, you know, just in one example of the contrast, um, it's the difference between hand-to-hand -hand combat and, uh, and an atomic bomb. Um, when Jesus walked the earth, he did hand-to-hand -hand combat with the devil. Yes, you know what I mean? I mean, he goes, you know, I cast you out, you know, in my name. <laughs> And they, they, would, they would go and stuff like that. When he died on the cross, he defeated all powers and principalities. And, and what does it say? And that he might raise us up far above all principalities and powers and mights and dominion and every name that is named, whether in this world or that which is to come. My God, I'm getting chills. What, what is, it's not that either. It's, there is therefore now no condemnation. See, where I come from, people be jumped up, running around, shouting right now. Where do I come from? <laughs> there you go. All right. So, so, so Paul's declaring that right here. He's saying that we, we even knew Jesus that way, but we don't know him that way anymore. There is therefore, you know, he's saying that if any man, therefore, if any man be in Christ, man, New reality, new understanding of you and them and Jesus 
and old things are passed away and get ready. This is what he uses about the last five verses, and I'll just sum it up in just a few words, is after saying all that, he goes, be ye reconciled to God. Do you understand what that, in the context of what that means? That means stop knowing him after the flesh, trying to chase Jesus, you know, it's like, you know, in your daily walk, you know, and uh, Jesus, you know, help me. You know, we say, well, blind Bartimaeus did that. Well, he was blind. You're supposed to see, you know. Ever heard of Amazing Grace? <laughs> but now I see, <laughs> you know. And again, we're not chasing Jesus. We're his feet. We're carrying Jesus. We're the body of Christ. We, we are the living embodiment of him who is the resurrection. And if we reduce it down, back down, even in the gospel, you know, folks, you do realize that the New Testament actually didn't begin until after the gospels. After the cross, there was no, there was no church formed, you know, during the gospels. He was still walking as a, you can say walking as a man, walking as a prophet under the, the Abrahamic covenant and was fulfilling the law and setting it aside. But what, what, every time he showed up after the resurrection, what was the first words out of his mouth? Hi, everybody. Peace, 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 or peace be still, or please shut up. <laughs> Jesus would never say that, but. Please be at peace. Receive what I just did. Receive where you're at now in me. Well, we know that it took a little while. Paul's the one who really, who really saw this and started laying it out and going, you know, you know the, I mean, that's why in theological circles there are discrepancies in these things because people say, well, the Jesus that Paul preached is very different than the Jesus of the Gospels. Well, yeah, I mean, as far as the relationship, you know, just chasing after Jesus, trying to do the right thing, you know, getting in on some good stuff, but you not being changed at all. I mean, I'm thinking if Jesus is really this, this good, how did he have one bad guy with him the whole time? Judas. I mean, why didn't he get saved? I mean, the way I, you know, I'm, again, I'm weird. I don't put this on everybody, but I, I, I think things, you know. I've heard people in my 40 years of, in the ministry, 40 some odd years in the ministry of people say, we need to get so close to God that when we walk into a town, everybody just falls down with, from the presence of God. Well, it never happened with Jesus. I don't know, I'm just, you know, I don't know might have happened with some other people and even the people and I know of where it did happen and they'll tell you I mean it's written in books but come back years later and that place is darker than it was before you came there folks there is a place that is not dark it's in Christ okay. it'll never be dark and and uh, that's see we're not trying to save everybody in the world we're trying to save those that God has chosen. That, those, and I'm not talking about Calvinism. I'm talking about those that will answer the call. You know, right. he's just trying to call some out. That's right. You know. Well, the church is the called out ones, but called into what? Well, wow, not called into Christianity. Not called into all those kind of things that, that most people put it there. We have been called in Christ, and it says that many times in the scriptures. Yes. Yes. And it says that, uh, actually, I've, <laughs> I've got it, the next couple of scriptures we're going to get through here. All right, so the basis of resurrection is that Jesus brought you into a new way of being and seeing yourself. Only by being in Christ. 
a new way of being and seeing, a new way of being and seeing. That's the revelation of Christ. The revelation of Christ is not knowing a bunch of deep stuff that doesn't make any difference in your own life, you know. Um, I relate this story sometimes. I don't always relate this little part. <clears throat> but years ago, after being in the ministry for years, having been a missionary, preaching Christ and Him crucified, coming back to the States, being in ministry at a certain place, and at a certain juncture, man, things just things just got bad and I ended up uh, being led of the Lord with my wife to leave the particular group that we were with and she and I just went into our living room and just began to seek the Lord and just to cry out and and people kept coming by and wanting me to start a church and stuff like that and I said look I need Jesus I don't know I don't want to start a church I, I and God withdrew all the feelings and literally like a siphon sucked all the knowledge that I had gained up to that point and all that was left was I'm dead and I'm in Jesus. That was really all I had. And so even though I, my soul was freaking out because everything wasn't happening the way it was before and when I opened the word I didn't see anything. Anything. That went on for a long time. And, and I, I didn't feel his presence anymore. And so when I'd go to him, I'd go, well, you know, where's your presence? He goes, well, I'm right there in you. And you're in me. And you're dead. And if that happened once, it happened a hundred times. Honestly. You know? And I was, I just, I just, I, my soul was wanting to hold on to everything that was comforting but apparently wasn't real in it. That's, that's what's important to, that I'm trying to say here. It wasn't real yet. It was real, but it wasn't real in me. It was real to me, but it wasn't real in me. And God held off and held off. And, you know, I know that he loves me, and I know that he wanted to move on my behalf, but he loved me, my heart for Jesus more than he loved my soul for help me get me out of this, you know? So he kept holding off and holding off. And, and it was, the, it was there's no way to describe how weird it is when the way I got saved, I met Jesus and he was just there and real and, you know, just powerful miracles and everything going on. And then, and then the word, the word just started coming alive for me. And then just all the time, the Holy Spirit, you know, sharing and, and, you know, being a missionary and doing, you know, assistant pastor of a church and all sorts of stuff. But to have it where it feels like, because there is no feeling, it feels like God's against me. But, you know, like God left you. I mean, it'd be like the temple in Ezekiel where he just got up and left, you know. How's that for a church service? <laughs> you know, and uh, and my mind was like little scratchy things in a in the side of a wall or dirt. You know, trying to find something. My mind just kept going. I gotta get. I gotta get this. I gotta get the Lord. I gotta. And I was just like, there was this feverish thing. You know of. Uh, uh, it occurred to me the other day that there's a difference between hunger and no rest. That's right. Rest. You know, that you can be hungry and be, still be at rest. But that, that gnawing thing, it was like, i got to get something. It was like, oh, Lord, show me something or just move on me or give me a sign. I mean, <laughs> you know. Let, you know, okay, I, you know, this is, you know, after a while you start panicking. Okay, Lord, I, I believe you're still here because he kept saying, you know, you're dead and I'm in you and you're in me and that's all I'm going to say. I'm going, okay, okay, I'm going to accept that, but, but just, just give me a sign that this really is the right path. You know, just, just, just anything, just the slightest thing. I mean, really, I mean, just like a little breeze. Just like, okay, I got it. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it, and he didn't do it, and he didn't do it, and he didn't do it, and didn't do it, and, you know, Karen, you remember all that. 
<clears throat> she was there in a bunch of those days. And <clears throat> I was scared to death, but in the depth of my core, I was stable. Because there wasn't a lot of clutter. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, I remember you showed me this, you know, and, or whatever. You know, he just wiped it all out. And he said, here's, here's your core, here's my core. Let's just start relating on this. And he said, when I get through with you, that will be your core, and you won't. I, he said, I'll be able to send feelings and all sorts of stuff your way, but you're not going to be moved by it. That's right. You know, you're going you're gonna to be with me. You're going to be with me where I want to be. I thought, wow, Lord, is that possible? And here's why, here's why I said, Lord, is that possible? After going through all of that, I felt so inadequate in myself. All I had was the cross and Christ. And it's all I knew that was right in the whole world at that time. It's all I knew. And I was scared in my soul, but I'd never experienced a stability like that. Because, because all of my stability came from all this teaching I had or these feelings or the fact that he was always with me or that he would confirm something or do something or whatever. And he took all that away. And it's like there's only, you know, like you're on the edge of a cliff and there's a cross sticking out off the side of it. And as you fall, you grab hold of it and you're just going, okay, this is it. You didn't, you didn't leave nothing else here. You wanted me to be like this. And it brought me, you know, and I'm still growing in these things and everything, but it, it, it began the process of bringing me into a weakness that found Christ and him crucified in the way that we teach as a strength, as a strength, as a, as a anchor to my soul. So that if my soul still freaked out, you know, that's used in Hebrews, you know, my soul still freaks out, you know, the ship can be up there and the storm going on and you're anchored, you know, it's like. <laughs> but he said anchored in behind the veil, which is in Christ, folks. And so he let my soul freak and go through all this stuff, but he maintained a strength there. And, and since that time, I've been through a lot of other things, really, really hard things. And at times, even one time, I, I told the Lord, I said, well, why don't you just take me? I'm just, I really can't, you know, handle it. Just, just take me home. And the Holy Spirit, like, nudged me. He didn't say anything. He just kind of nudged me. And I said, you know, I kind of looked over at the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm talking about. It's kind of. And then I looked back up to the Father and I said, however, <laughs> if, you, if you can squeeze any more out of this empty tube of toothpaste, then I give you permission to use me again. But all of the stability that, that I did feel to be able to say, you know what, I've been through this enough times to know it, it's not over until he says it's over. Not over until he says it's over. And to to stop all my freakouts, to stop all of my fears enough, not to end them, but to stop them enough to say, you know, but in the midst of all of this, I have an anchor for my soul. I am dead. I'm in Christ, and Christ is in me. And it held me, and it held me, and it held me for years and through all this stuff. And when I teach it, I genuinely feel like I can never say say it like like I've heard it yes. I mean what a shame because the glory of what I've heard is it's eternal and it's just so blessed 
But I want to I want to be able to release spirit in life. And I want to do that this year. And so I ask you to please don't stop praying for one another. And pre please be vigilant with these things. Because I feel the heart of the Lord that this is a season, this is a time. This is a time. You know, this is a time where something genuine and real can happen. And I'll just, I'll just close with this, and that is, you know, I'm fixing to be knocked out of the scene, and I feel I don't want to be knocked out of the scene. I mean, that was one of the reasons why I didn't want to get surgery. I want to be here for you every day, every moment that I can. So I'm going to ask you, you know, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you, you know, Jim and Ben and Mike and Scott and all of them. Thank you, Joan. You know, I'm going to ask you to, to stay with this for the, for the Lord's heart, for the people's sake. We can't drop the ball. We can't do it now. What we can't do for ourselves, God will empower us to do for others. Amen. You know? Well, and, and by, you know, pouring out, you'll get filled up. He that watereth shall also be watered himself. And, and for all of us here, I'm going to say just don't stop praying. Don't stop thinking about one another. Don't, don't get so worried about your little area that you forget that we're all in this together. And I'm you know, I'm, I feel like Joshua in the sense of I want, you know, I want us all to go in. You know. So, all of you on Skype, we're praying for you. We just ask you, keep praying for us too. We're all in this together. We want Jesus. We want an increase of Christ to be manifest in, in different forms of breakthroughs for our lives. Father, we just ask you to continue to soften our hearts. Continue to flow through this body even after I'm laid out for a while. And that the gatherings would be better than even if I was here, that they would be so filled with spirit and life. Father, may it not just be in services, but Finding ways, give to our people here creative ways, not just for me, creative ways to reach one another, to consider someone's condition and find answers for them, means of help. Father, we thank you for the things that flow down from you that we have great assurance of what you want to do based on the sense of your heart that we have within us. Father, I just ask you to make the last part of the year now greater than the first part, even though that means a lot of times tearing down before there's a breakthrough greater until we all walk into the new year Maybe, maybe beat down and maybe uh, tired and uh, wounded, but singing and happy because we know that you have fulfilled your purpose. Not that you removed every problem we ever had in our life, but we have that sense that you're, you were with us through the whole thing and brought us out and into the new year in Jesus' name. Amen.
We're dismissed.